What were the thoughts that were going through your head? It didn't seem like a permanent solution at that time. I don't ever remember the doctor telling me that I was paralyzed and that I couldn't walk. It was, in my mind, not a big deal. And I was going to overcome just like the hundreds of stories I'd heard before. And it, it became harder to swallow the further along I got without progress. Welcome to Stories of Hope in Hard Times, the show that explores how people endure and even thrive in difficult times, all with God's help. I'm your host, Tamara K. Anderson. Join me on a journey to find inspiring stories of hope and wisdom learned in life's hardest moments. My next guest is a Utah native and has always been very active, playing football, basketball, lacrosse, and anything else he could get into. He graduated from high school in 2009, served an LDS mission in France, and attended Utah State University. In March of 2015, he was in an accident where he broke his neck, which left him paralyzed from the chest down. Interestingly, though, he did not let this slow him down, and he graduated from USU with a Bachelor of Science in Management Information Systems just six months after his original expected graduation date, and married his sweetheart Sloan. He has since gone biking, skiing, parasailing, scuba diving, skydiving, and more. He currently works for Master Control as an onboarding support engineer. I am pleased to introduce Matt Bowen. Matt, are you ready to share your story of hope? Absolutely. Awesome. I'm really excited to have Matt here with us today. Um, His family lives just down the street from us, so it's been really fun to watch him go through this. And I've just been so impressed how he doesn't, he has not let becoming paralyzed paralyze his life and so I think that's pretty cool but I just have to ask you how in the world did you go scuba diving (laughs) (laughs) it's something I've always wanted to do and it was uh just kind of uh I guess kind of came up on us um and so we went on a vacation to Mexico Uh and just in an all-inclusive resort and there was an option to go scuba diving and so we were we went and met with them we're like hey like i'd like to do this have you ever done it and like oh yeah we no problem we do it with, with, with people in wheelchairs and so no issues and they just wanted to make sure i had you know somewhat the functionality to to go underwater and hold my breath and kind of you know move around and and so um they had a couple people that had, were were there that that strapped me up and and tested me out and they're like all right cool let's do it and they threw <laughs> threw me off the back of the oh boat and i i got in the water uh and which was you know a little traumatized a little reminiscent oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah so i was in the water by myself strapped to a tank and of oxygen oh, and, and i just had to kind of stay calm and and breathe into a little breathing tube but uh, after you got over that initial shock i we descended down and it was it was such a super cool experience so wow now had you been scuba diving before never had done that before so and the bucket list has stayed <laughs> the same <laughs> yeah exactly yeah it's not it's not changed at all and in fact i think it's grown since <laughs> since being paralyzed but that was that was something i i really enjoyed and it's definitely still on the bucket list but go to different places and yeah. try scuba diving and and see unfortunately we weren't able to see very many uh, animals or fish but uh, yeah, I'm hopefully, I think it'd be super cool to go out scuba diving in like Hawaii and see some of the dolphins and turtles and, you know, whatever else is over there. So Yeah, that's awesome. Oh, fantastic. Well, a little bit of backstory. So we're going to go back to um, your accident and why water was traumatizing <laughs> to you, because I'm sure people are wondering what is the backstory there. And so why don't you take us to spring break 2015 and explain what happened? Yeah, absolutely. So we went to uh, just during spring break of college um, with my friends and I decided to go out to California and just kind of hanging out, having a good time there on a lot of body surfing and spike ball and all sorts of the beach stuff. And 
And so on the last Saturday in California, Huntington Beach area, um, well, not area, on the actual beach, but I was body surfing in and got tired and decided to catch a wave in. And from that uh, wave, I just jumped in, caught it like I had done, you know, a dozen times that that week. And this particular one was different for whatever reason. And so it dropped me on the top of my head and I felt or heard or whatever a pop happen and knew that there was something wrong. And right and that my head was like, I knew I hit my head really hard and I thought it was more, that was the issue at first. Um, but anyway, I knew I just was going to let it tumble me around the wave and I wasn't going to try to move until, uh, it was done moving there. And, and so once it kind of subsided and I was just floating there, I tried to move and realized that I couldn't move anything. And, And I was trying to flip over and get up out of the water as I was face down and, and couldn't breathe. And so I knew I was in trouble and, uh, opened my eyes just to look around and see if anybody was around coming and, and I didn't see anybody. And so, uh, I held my breath as long as I could. And once I got to the stage where my body was going to force me to breathe, I just said a little prayer and I said, you know what, Heavenly Father, save me if you want to. Uh, if not, I will see you in a couple minutes. Wow. And, uh, yeah. So after, after that, my body forced me to breathe and I took in a bunch of water and I don't know how long after that, um, I imagine it was just a few seconds, but could have been longer. Uh, I got flipped over by just one of the guys I was out there body surfing with. And, and I looked up at him, I said, I'm dead, I'm dead. And he said, no, you're not. And I said, well, I'm paralyzed. And so you knew, yeah. Oh, I was, I knew that, I couldn't move anything. And so I knew that I didn't know exactly what the diagnosis was or what really was going on, but yeah, it was kind of sunk. And so he, he, um, what's the word brought me over, floated me over to the, to the shore and the lifeguards were there and they, you know, put me up on a stretcher and got me talking and keeping me kind of alert and, we got me up into a, a truck and in an ambulance from there and then over to the closest hospital where I had surgery, you know, a few hours later and then there's that. So wow. paralyzed from the chest down without functioning hands, triceps, or uh, really anything below my chest except for four toes on my left foot. Four toes <laughs> on your left foot. Well, there you all, go. All of them except the big ones, so... <laughs> For whatever reason, that one, it'll, it'll come back eventually, but it's taking its time. (laughs) That is crazy. So when you were in the hospital recovering from your surgery and you knew what had happened, that you had broken your neck, um, what were the thoughts that were going through your head? It didn't seem like a permanent solution at that time. I don't ever remember the doctor telling me that I was, you know, that was paralyzed and that I couldn't walk. It was just kind of a surreal thing because I was, um, from the accident, I, they had me on a lot of drugs and, and, um, you know, just pain medicine and other kind of things to combat, um, like when I, cause when I breathed in the water, it gave me pneumonia in my lungs. And so... Uh-huh. I was combating that and trying to learn to breathe on my own and they had me hooked up to a ventilator and they, uh, or a breathing tube rather. And they realized that that wasn't going to work. And I, every time I started to come to, I started thrashing around and taking out the breathing tube. And, and so, um, yeah, so it was a week of basically a, a medical coma wow. that I don't remember at all. And when I came to, I was, I was pretty confused. Um, and I think the doctor, or they've told me that the doctor told me I was paralyzed before I even really remember, like right when I was kind of coming out. And so it was, it was kind of a surreal experience of like, okay, what's going on? And I had to really assess, um, what, what actually was happening at that time. And so, um, yeah. So, so that being said, when I kind of realized what my diagnosis was and what was going on, um, it, it would, it would, it seemed temporary. Like, in my mind, I was like, yeah, I might not be able to right now, but, you know, give me a couple. It'll come back. Yeah, give me a little bit and I'll be, I'll be up and walking back to my normal active self. Sure. 
and and uh, <laughs> it hasn't happened quite yet. But <laughs> but yeah, it was kind of it was in my mind not a big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, well, obviously a big deal, but not like as big of a deal. And and I was gonna overcome just like the hundreds of stories I'd heard before. And and uh, yeah, so it's kind of it, it became harder to swallow the further along I got without progress. Right. So, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so when did it finally hit you that this was permanent? Did you have like a sudden, like, I don't think this is, you know, that I'm (laughs) going to be able to move my arms the way I want to, that I'm going to be able to walk. Yeah. I, I, I mean, there were definitely times throughout, the hospital once I was kind of on the rehab floor um things that the rehab doctors would bring up or the you know occupational therapist he would constantly was showing me videos of people that were paralyzed and they've you know they've overcome and they can do this too and I was so hard-headed about it I was like no like that's that's great I'm glad you're showing me good for them but that's not me Mm. and you know as that kind of those things kept happening and the hospital drug on and I wasn't progressing. It was like, okay, uh, this might not be, you know, in my future, but I'm going to keep going. And there's a state of the art, uh, outpatient therapy that we were going to go to and they have this walking machine and Mm -hmm. that's what was going to get me back into it. And then, you know, we did that. And so I, and there's never really one moment that I was like, you know what, this is just not in the cards. And even still, like, I don't, feel like it's not in the cards, but I've kind of accepted that it's, it's not there right now. And, uh, I've addressed it as such. And, and so it's, but I still, I still try to hold hope the fact that I will walk again or, or something, you know, extra healing will happen, whether it's, you know, a a miracle or if it's a technological miracle or whatever, but it's, it's still, um, some hope that I hold on to because, you know, otherwise I feel like it's hard to keep going some days. I can only imagine. So what were some of the hardest things for you, um, as you were going through the recovery? The hardest thing for me was not being able to drink. Really? So because of the, um, pneumonia, what they decided to do was cut a hole in my throat Uh and the trach area it's called a tracheotomy and and because of that i had to relearn how to eat and drink again oh my and so i would get really thirsty and they had me hooked up to you know uh, feeding tubes but not putting anything in your mouth and drinking it it was just like such a stark change that i felt really thirsty all the time and i couldn't do anything so what they would do is they'd give me water swabs what is that it was like a popsicle looking thing, uh-huh. but the popsicle part was a sponge and oh. they dip it into water and uh-huh. then they put it in my mouth to basically just wet my mouth and give me that kind of somewhat satisfaction of having a drink. And I was, I had always begged for those cause I just was so dry mouth with all the other medications I was taking and, um, and then I wanted something more flavorful too after oh, I, I got used to the imagine. water. <laughs> And uh, I always really loved uh, root beer. And I convinced one of the nurses to give me a little dab of root beer one day, like right before I left the the ICU in California. And so uh, Did it she? was, yeah, <laughs> it was, it was amazing. Like it, I, manna from heaven, like it was so good. And so, um, but yeah, once I, once I moved from the, the water swabs, it moved, I got, I graduated to ice cubes that I could just suck on those and then eventually got to water. But those like first few weeks really were before I could have or drink anything. It was just, it was excruciatingly long Mm. and I I missed that way more than food or like anything else. It was just like, I just want to drink water. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. It's amazing. You don't think about these things, um, unless you don't have them, right? right? (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, food. Holy cow. Like, was there any particular food that you were like totally dying for? Yeah, I love, well, I I, I still like it, but I loved In-N-Out. And 
<laughs> while we were in California that week leading up to it, I had a double double almost every day. Oh yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I was craving in and out burger. I was just having withdrawals most likely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I just wanted a, a good double devil and wash it down with some root beer. And that was this, that was like my ultimate goal going off from there. So that, uh, that was your goal is I am yeah. someday going to have a double double and a root beer. <laughs> exactly. And that you was, did. I did. <laughs> I did just, uh, just like the week after I was out of the hospital, like that was when it went and had the double double. I don't think I was able to finish it, but I had the double double and a root beer and it was Life was good. <laughs> awesome. That's fantastic. <laughs> I love that. Um, so what were some of the other things that were hard for you after the accident, like coming home and having life be totally different than it was before? Just losing my independence. Mm-hmm. I was beholden to somebody else to do anything. If I wanted to go outside, I had to have somebody help me outside. If I, I, I wasn't, didn't have the strength to push myself in a wheelchair, I didn't have a wheelchair that worked for me. So it was just, I was, I was stuck doing anything. I, I had to have people help feed me, uh, get me a drink. Like they had to basically help me lift up the cup to my mouth. Like I literally couldn't do anything by myself. And, and that was so frustrating being from, you know, independent, stubborn college kid to completely dependent on everybody for every action in my life. Oh yeah. I can only imagine. Yeah. So that was, that was so difficult, but it, you know, it set me on a journey of, okay, what do I want in life? Do I want to, to live like this? I want to be dependent on everybody for everything all the time or you know what what am I going to do and and kind of projected me on the lines of of gaining regaining some independence as well as understanding that this life isn't necessarily about independence but um interdependence rather Mm, that's awesome I love that let's talk about that lesson (laughs) a little bit later okay (laughs) um so what what were some of the struggles besides eating and drinking and going places? Were there any others that were huge challenges for you? Yeah, so um, I don't know if it's TMI, but when you're in a, a wheelchair, losing bowel and bladder function and oh. having to manage those, like that's that seems to me that that's that's an oversight when when designing the human body. <laughs> Like if you're gonna if you're gonna get paralyzed, you might want to keep those like the things that you'll keep. Um, right. But uh, yeah, so that was a huge struggle and trying to relearn how to manage everything with that, and then um, getting myself dressed, getting myself just in and out of bed, moving from my chair to the bed, or uh, yeah, like that that kind of stuff. Being able to get up on my own or go get to bed on my own or take a nap in the middle of the day when I got tired. Mm. Um, those things were just so frustrating and trying to re relearn how to use a cell phone. Oh gosh. Yeah. yeah. I like I, for the, for the first, I don't know, six months, I probably couldn't really use a cell phone. I had to use my iPad for everything. Mm. Um, and was able because to your fine out. motor control wasn't there. Exactly. Yet. Yeah. No, I have no finger function really. And so I had to learn how to, yeah, to to uh, strap on a, a a strap around my hand and put a, a stylus in there and use that to tap around. Wow! And then you know it's just but but stepping points, right? And so right. then I got to finally after that, I got to a point where I could figure out how to use it on a cell phone, and then mm-hmm. kind of figure out how to use my hands and push my fingers in certain spots so I could use those. And yeah, so th- those kind of stuff were super frustrating and um, learning to dress was like the pinnacle of like, if I can learn how to dress myself, then I'll be independent. And (laughs) oh my gosh, that was so frustrating. Something that took me two minutes to do Mm -hmm. prior now takes me, you know, at that, at the early stages of learning how to do it was a, I couldn't do it. And knowing that, was really frustrating. And then B when I was able to finally do it, how long it took me, you know, over an hour to get dressed. And it's just really? like, man, this is crazy. And so since then I've brought the time down, but it still takes me a lot longer than the average person. So, wow. 
That's, that's crazy. So what were some of the lessons that you learned along the way? Being patient with myself is, was so hard. Um, but it's the only way to really overcome and, and learn how to do something. And it's, it's patience of, I I mean, everyone, I guess, kind of goes through these with whatever they're dealing with, or, you know, if you're training for a marathon and it might be a struggle learning to run for, you know, a certain amount of miles, Mm but, but, you know, everyone kind of has that, but it was just the minutia, the stupid things that everybody else can do in a matter of seconds or minutes that take me five to 10 times as long as everybody else. And so being patient with myself and understanding that, that it's just, it's different. It's a different lifestyle. And and maybe this, these things are my marathon, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe these things are what other people do when they work out or, or whatever else, but to be patient with myself and know that the more I got frustrated, the harder things became. Mm -hmm. And that if I could just, you know, uh, push through the pain or push through the, the struggle that I would eventually get there. And Mm -hmm. so that was number one. And the number two is that asking for help is not a sign of weakness, Mm -hmm. but it's really, it really is a sign of strength and recognizing your own struggles and things that you need help with, um, doesn't make you weak asking for help. It it allows you to become stronger. Mm Mm-hmm. I love that one. That's, that's a powerful lesson. And you're right. We all need to learn it. I think it is one of those fallacies that (laughs) is portrayed in today's society, (laughs) like constantly like man up, you're strong enough, you can do it. And it's, it's almost like, but we have these real feelings. We have these real struggles and I don't think God put us here to do it all on our own, Right? you know? (laughs) <laughs> totally. If, if so, it would just be one person trying to figure it out on their own. I know. So I really do. I, I'm glad you brought that up because I really do think that that is something that we need to learn and we need to yeah. be better at, especially in today's society. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to say I'm struggling, you know, and, and be able to talk about those kinds of things that we are struggling with. And I, I found it interesting that every time I open up about something that I'm struggling with, it seems to give other people permission mm-hmm. to open about, up about what they're struggling with. Right. And so I, sometimes I think we walk around with this facade on all of us, yeah. you know, <laughs> Totally. <laughs> and when, when you just dip a little below the surface and Everyone. get to know somebody, yeah, uh, you, everybody struggles. Exactly. And you just, you really can, can, understand and you feel i mean for me it always made me feel better it's like oh hey here's my struggles and and since i was so uh, my my struggles and everything were so out there physical mm-hmm. like every, they're just visible that's yeah. what i'm looking for um because it's so visible you everybody else feels almost a little more uh, the the ability that they can open up You're like wow yeah your struggles yeah here's kind of what i deal with like how do you how do you overcome? And, and you can just really feed off each other and grow together. And I'm like, Oh man, you know, and for, I know a lot of people, it's like, Oh, that kid, he's in a wheelchair. Like, man, at least I'm not dealing with that. And, <laughs> and other people would open up with me about their stuff. And I'm like, well, I might have a wheelchair, but at least I'm not dealing with that. <laughs> uh, you know? And so it's kind of, it's interesting though, that how much perspective you can gain from doing that. Yeah. One, and so that's that's a good reason to share, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then plus you're able to help each other and, yeah. and just get that much stronger all over. Yeah, that's awesome. No, I love that. Now, I know you told me that when you were in the hospital, your brother came in and taught you something that you yes. have kind of clung on to, especially in those early days and weeks and months in the hospital. What yeah. was that thing that he taught you? The, it's the the ten minute rule. So he he came in one day and I was just venting and I was like, you know, this sucks. This is so hard. I don't understand why. Like, why does God allow this to happen? Why do I have to go through this? I'm not strong enough. I can't do this. All this stuff. And mm-hmm. he, as a good brother, would he was just listening to me and and after I kind of let it all out, he he empathized with me. But he said, I challenge you to just keep your complaining and your self-loathing to uh, 10 minutes a day. 
And other than that, you do whatever you can to overcome and, and beat this. And, and I thought, okay, that's, that's some good advice. And, and he's, he also, um, you know, if you remember back in the day when you had cell phone and it was not an unlimited plan, you had the rollover minutes. Oh yeah. So he said, if you don't use those 10 minutes in a day, you know, some days are better then you can roll those over to the other days when you, <laughs> when you need a little extra time. <laughs> and, and so I said, okay, you know, that's, that's some good advice. I'm going to, I'm going to take it to heart. And each day it was, you know, sometimes things were, were hard and maybe I just need to have a good cry for five or 10 minutes and, and just kind of complain and be like, man, why me? Why this, you know? And after that it was, all right, I'm going to buck up and I'm going to do it and I'm going to take care of things and I'm going to do everything that is in my power to, to overcome and beat this. And it made a world of a difference. It was so much less complaining, so much less focus on me and my struggles and, Oh, you know, let me feel bad for myself. Everybody else should feel bad for me too. And, and a focus of, okay, I can do things. I can, you know what, maybe I can't do this today, but maybe tomorrow I'll have another shot at it. Or I can actually learn how to transfer myself and I can use a manual wheelchair or I can learn how to dress myself or I can eat a double double, uh, you know, whatever, <laughs> yes. whatever it was, but it was, it, it changed the mindset from complaining and my life sucks to hey, look, look what I can do. What's, what are my possibilities when, and it just opened up a whole new world. That's awesome. So 10 minutes with rollover. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it was, and it, it was sometimes some days were hard. And so it was nice to have those rollovers where, man, this day is just really tough. I, 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 I made, need to cry five times. Exactly. Today. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, for example, there was, uh, several good days and, and I had really good support in the hospital. So sometimes I was able to distract myself enough to not even think about it. And I could use a whole, you know, 10 minutes to roll over it. Um, but there was, there was one day in particular where I was learning to, uh, eat again, and I, I took a kind of bigger bite of a sandwich and choked on it a little bit and washed it down with some Gatorade. But in so doing, I aspirated, meaning oh, no. I, I took the Gatorade into my lungs. And, uh, you know, an hour or two after that, my, my oxygen sensor started buzzing. Oh, no. And some doctors come into there and into, into the room and start looking at it and they're like oh and and then if you ever hear those codes coming through in the hospital uh-huh. and they're like code red we need all hands on deck to whatever and i've heard those several times and once there was a false one to my room and so i heard it and i was like i think that's my room they must have messed up and all of a sudden a flood of 12 to 15 oh, doctors and nurses are in my room and i'm like uh okay this isn't great so uh, I, they, they figure out that I aspirated. I was with, even with a ventilator on, uh, pumping a hundred percent oxygen in my body was only, uh, absorbing like 80%. Oh, gosh. And if you're at a low point, it can cause brain damage and it's, you know, super oh. big deal. So I'm on the rehab floor. I had make, been making huge strides to my double, double and root beer. Uh-huh. And all of a sudden I'm set back. I go down to the respiratory ICU oh, and no. I'm back to ice chips. Oh no. And it was, that day was so difficult. Um, it was so hard to see all the progress I had made and I had to just completely drop back. So I had to use a few more, <laughs> few more minutes use- that day. <laughs> this is my rollover minute exactly. today and I'm going to cry and just bemoan the fact that I had to go backwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had, I probably even used up a little overcharge of the, that day, but, um, but you know, some days are like that. You have those, those tougher, tougher days and you got to let it out and allow yourself to feel those things. But the fact of the matter was I, I couldn't dwell on it too long. And that day, even still just trying to, to fight it off and focus on other things. But then the next day, and I was still in the respiratory ICU and I had to, to fight back to get back to where I was. And I could have just dwelled and say, you know, this is not possible. I'm not going to do it. But I, uh, I, I just kept fighting. And like, like I said earlier, I had that double double not too long after. Yes. That. So the lesson there is t- when you have setbacks, it's okay to feel the emotions of that setback. But then when you're done crying about it, take a big breath <laughs> and say, all right, 
let's keep moving forward. Exactly. Yeah. And, and for me growing up, I always hated my emotions and I just always swept them under the rug. And it's not, I don't, I don't know why I just never enjoyed feeling things like that. Mm. So, um, getting to a point where I'm having all these emotions that I can't really control and they're creeping up and it's just like, I I hated the feeling still, but I had to learn and still continue to learn that it's okay to have the feelings. It's okay to embrace those and say, you know what? I need my 10 minutes today. I gotta, I gotta use those, but, but to not dwell on them Mm -hmm. really. uh, And, and not just get stuck in that kind of depression allows you to move forward. Oh, That is fantastic advice. We're going to take a quick break, but when we get back, will you talk to us a little bit more about that interdependence and then a little bit about extreme ownership? Absolutely. Awesome. How many of you out there feel like your life is chaotic, crazy, and completely awful compared to the norm? What if I were to tell you that you are normal for you. I am so excited to announce that my book, Normal For Me by Tamara K. Anderson is now available for purchase on Amazon. This book took me 10 years to write and I share 20 years worth of lessons learned in my life detours, including being in a car accident and having two of my children diagnosed on the autism spectrum. In this book, I share the secrets of how I made it from despair to peace with God's help. I also include a bonus diagnosis survival guide at the very end of my Normal For Me book. The diagnosis survival guide includes 12 tips to survive and thrive in tough times. Wouldn't you like to know what those are? So what are you waiting for? Grab your copy of Normal For Me today on Amazon. And we're back. I'm talking to Matt Bowen today about his experience recovering after a devastating accident that left him paralyzed from the chest down. So Matt, we've talked a little bit about 10 minutes a day rule, giving yourself that grace time Mm -hmm. to feel your feelings, especially if you're feeling down. Uh, We've talked about the importance of being patient with yourself and persistent. So why don't we talk a little bit about this interdependence versus independence? What, tell me about that lesson and what that meant to you. Yeah. I didn't really realize, um, after being injured, how important, um, my, like my whole, my whole thought was I got to get independent again. Mm. And, and so, um, a little bit after that uh, initial, I guess those hospital days and realizing I wasn't really going to recover like I thought I was, I still needed so much help from my family and friends. And it was frustrating going through all that and, and real and not getting to the, the point where I even like the prospect of becoming fully independent was, was daunting and so it was a, a kind of a, a frustrating pain point for me. But one of the people I had met shortly after I started going to outpatient rehab was, um, and that was a, a quadriplegic as well. He posted about this on his Facebook and said um, something happened. He'd been out, he'd been uh, out of his injury for a little bit longer than I have, and and was like, he, he seemed to me like just this stellar amazing guy that's overcome it all and just had all the answers. Right. And right. something happened. He, I think he fell out of his wheelchair and he had to get picked up and, and it was kind of a frustrating thing for him. And yeah. he's like, you know what? I realized that it's about interdependence rather than independence. Mm. And what do you, what do you mean by that? Or what we mean, what I mean by interdependence is that we're not in this life to become independent or to be fully dependent on others, but to depend on each other and and learn and grow from each other rather than being, you know, oh, I'm super macho, head honcho, whatever. I can do everything and I am the, the only person. I don't, I'm the strong, independent woman that don't need no man type thing. Mm-hmm. Like we're, we're here to, to learn from each other and grow from each other. And it's, it's such a sign of strength to recognize your weaknesses and 
to embrace others help. And, and for me being in the wheelchair at that point and realizing, you know what, I need help now. And that's not a sign of weakness. Mm. I can continue to learn independence and, and do things on my own, but you know, unfortunately being in a wheelchair, like I will just probably always need a little bit of help throughout my life. And that's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely a good thing that I can ask for help and get the help I need. And I can also give help in ways that I never thought I would. And so to, to get that interdependence throughout life is so, um, fulfilling and, and opens up just a completely new world of possibilities. Like if I was stuck on being independent and not accepting help from anybody, I I wouldn't be able to do or have done nearly the things that I've already done and everything would take, you know, maybe super long time to, <laughs> to do things. And yeah, I might gain a couple extra minutes here or there by becoming stronger and more independent. But, um, having family and friends around just opens up a, so many more possibilities. Do you think that because you've learned to be interdependent, do you think your friends and relationships have become better because Absolutely, of that? Yeah. yeah, it's it's interesting because um, sometimes I'm a little more stubborn. I'm like, <laughs> no, I don't want help, especially when I am, am not having good days and I got to prove to myself that I can you know do things and and it it kind of damages the the really. Well, I don't know if I'd say damages, but hurts the relationship a little bit that it, you know, my friend, my, cause my, my f friends and family, all they want to do is help me and help me be successful. Same as, you know, I want for them. And so by refusing their help and being all, you know, independent, it, it causes somewhat of a rift. And so, um, but uh, excuse me, um, by accepting their help and by allowing myself to be helped, I, I mean, it just, it, it, it's a level of service too. Mm -hmm. And I think most, most of us have learned if you serve people, you learn to really love them. And, and so by that whole, um, aspect, we, we develop greater love for each other and it, it really in, improves our relationships. Oh, I love that. I actually learned that same lesson <laughs> after uh, my husband and I were in a bad car accident and I had, to recover from that. Mm -hmm. And so I remember learning that and it dawned on me that, oh my gosh, I learned to love those people because they served me. Mm -hmm. And I'd never seen that other side of the cycle before. Right. I'd always been the one serving. Yeah. And so it's interesting to be on that receiving end of service and go, oh my gosh, love works both ways, right? Right. <laughs> and, and realizing that it's, you, you, it's, you, you're grateful for it, but like you have to, like for me, I had to, realized that they wanted to serve. And I had people that say, I want to serve you. Like, I want to do this for you. It's not, it's not about you. It's not, I need this <laughs> in my life. Me. Right. <laughs> and so you're like, wow, okay. That really makes a difference to you. Like I can allow myself to be served and being, um, you know, pre-paralysis. I'm, I'm six foot four. Hasn't mm -hmm. changed yet. Um, but, <laughs> uh, six foot four as 230 pounds, just a big guy. And I loved being able to give service and pick, you know, move and, and pick things up and, and just be that physical um, beacon that people could have for service. And so to have that on the flip side and I have to, and having to be served, it was, it was a mentality that had to change mm. and it was kind of a hard thing to learn. But once I did, it was like, Oh, okay. Like you said, it was like, Oh, this is, this is nice. Like I can, I can appreciate being served and, 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 and have that love for people. Yeah. That's so cool. That's awesome. Talk to me about extreme ownership. What does that mean? So, <laughs> talking about in interdependence um, as well as extreme ownership now is the fact of, I mean, it's not really, it's kind of goes in with being independent, but it's not, um, you know, it works with interdependence as well, but it's something that I had to learn that I was in charge of my own happiness mm -hmm. and that nobody else could could give me that or control it for me. And obviously we all have ex uh, external circumstances that can um, push us one way or the other, but that at the end of the day, I can control how I feel about that. And so 
there was a book that I read um, when I was kind of going through a hard time learning um, after after getting married and kind of learning navigating marriage oh, as yeah. well as with paralysis. Yeah. And, and so it's kind of a tricky thing to, to do, but um, I, I had to learn that I was ultimately, again, um, in control of my own happiness. And so I read a book by some ex-Navy SEALs that talked about extreme ownership. And it didn't matter what happened in their life, in their in their Navy SEAL adventures, whether it was, you know, somebody on their um, squad that maybe messed something up and caused a failed mission, or if it was something that they did, you know, directly that caused some issues or or the successes that they had, um, it was, it was all boiled down to what they did and what their decisions were. And so one, one point that, um, was brought up frequently, it was people that were around them that maybe made mistakes, um, that caused uh, either a failed mission or other issues. And they, they would come back to them as a leader and they'd say, you know what, that person made a mistake because I didn't train them well enough, or I didn't put them in the position that they needed to be. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. And at the time, like I said, I was still trying to figure out how to live independently and, you know, with, with help from my wife. And if she didn't do something that I was expecting her to do, or I, I wanted her to clean something or, or empty the dishwasher because I struggled doing it. It took me, you know, three or four times as long or, if you know, I, and I realized that it was such a crappy way to live, and mm. I was so constrained. My happiness was co- so constrained by what she did that I was I, I would get myself in these kind of funks and and almost like dark places where I couldn't see what you know her her perspective was, mm. and all I could see was my happiness is struggling because of you, and. I ended up changing my perspective and say, you know what, if I want something done a certain way, I need to do it or I need to voice it. And I need to say, Hey, can you help me out with this? Can you do this for me? Or here's where, um, I'm, I'm struggling. Like I need, uh, you know, let's talk about this. And then after realizing that I was like, wow, I have all this extra freedom in my life and ability to be happy. And then I realized it extended into my, other relationships at work or with friends and at work, you know, again, it was like, um, people that weren't fulfilling their end of the, of the deals that we had. And, and I was, it was, it, was, it all came back to me and it made things, uh, just, a, a, everything opened up and that I had the ability to really control my own destiny. And I, if I just, couldn't blame anybody else. And I was the one to blame that meant I had control over the situation Mm. and it was, it was just so free and it's so cool because as humans, we want to blame everybody else (laughs) all the time for all of our circumstances. And so it's like, you know what? Hey, uh, that person, they did something sucky and maybe it really does damage us. Maybe it causes a big thing, but what could we have done to avoid that? And maybe we couldn't have avoided that. Maybe there's nothing, but what can we do to change that circumstance? Mm. And again, like it was this the most freeing thing I've ever experienced in my life. So it's almost like you had this um, mindset shift yeah, where you decided, okay, I get to choose, I get to decide how I view this situation. Exactly. I can view it as something like, I'm totally going to blame them for the rest of my life for this, or I'm going to choose to say, you know what, that happened, but I'm choosing to look at it differently Mm -hmm. and I'm going to move forward despite that hard thing or that struggle. Is that, is that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so like even with paralysis, like I never had anybody to blame for my paralysis. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't, that wasn't something that was a struggle, but then I had to learn that later on because things that I needed being paralyzed, if I needed extra help with something or if I needed, um, yeah, I mean, that was kind of what it boiled down to, but I had to realize that I can do things and just because it takes me longer, um, you know what, like I'm still in control of my life. And just because I have to do things maybe differently than somebody else, 
it's not their fault that they can manage things or do things, you know, better or, or more efficiently, but it's, it's a mindset, like you said, a total mindset change Hmm. that puts everything in the perspective of I'm in control of my destiny and I actually can control my destiny. I'm not stuck in a, in a rut waiting for somebody else to, to change or do something or whatever. And it was, like I said, so freeing. It's like getting, it's like you're in traffic and all of a sudden, you know, you get to that point where it just opens up. Like if there's an accident mm-hmm. and right there and all of a sudden the entire road is yours yeah. and you can just cruise. It's like that whole, it was very transition. liberating. Yeah. It was, it was crazy. So it's it such a cool, um, concept to, to learn. And it's made my life. Now I, I still have the tendency to blame mm-hmm. and I want to be like, you know, it's your fault for this or that. Or, and, and I have to kind of remind myself and read, read the book or whatever, but get back to the point of like, you know what, this is on me mm. and it makes life so much happier. Yeah. So yeah. Take that ownership of, of your life basically. Yeah. And That's I feel awesome. like that concept gets brought up a lot, but the, the phrase extreme ownership was really what resonated to me. So I kind of keep that on my, on the top of my mind. That's awesome. I love that. Thanks for sharing that. So you you have taken this extreme ownership to a whole new level in that you have not let this paralysis stop you. <laughs> Holy cow, I mean, parasailing, biking, skiing, graduating from college, getting married. I mean, these are things that, you know, somebody else might look at it and say, I'm never going to be able to do any of these things. And you have just said, no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Why not? <laughs> right. I, I mean, I kind of joke and I always say like, well, what's the worst going to happen? Like get paralyzed. So <laughs> I already did that. So <laughs> right? yeah, if I, if I can, if I can overcome this, like, you know, nothing, nothing's going to stop me. That's awesome. That's a funny way to ask that question. <laughs> what's the worst that could happen? Oh, you're funny. So, um, tell me through all of this, I know at the beginning you had a lot of why questions to God. Mm-hmm. How has your relationship with God evolved or changed through all of this? It's it's super interesting and it it is very roller coastery, I'd say, a lot of the time. But I thought I had a really good relationship with God um prior to to paralysis. I'm serving my mission. And when I came back or when I finished the mission and I was thought I really understood God and then all of a sudden I'm paralyzed and it's like, really like what is going on here? And so constantly asking why, and are you really there? Do you really understand it? And so I had two kind of um, epiphanies, one that drives me nuts and maybe it helps other people this, this kind of phrase or whatever, but is that, um, God gives you struggles because you can handle it. And that was really frustrating because I was like, no, I can't like what this isn't, this isn't about like what I can handle or whatever. But I I realized that God doesn't necessarily give us struggles because we can handle it. And to me, at least in my case of paralysis, um, it's something that just happened Mm. and God was, is, is, and has been there and will continue to be there to support me and help me through it. And it's not my strength that helps that, that I'm able to handle things, but it's him and me together. And when I've tried to, to handle things without him, I, I can't, mm-hmm. it's just, and so having God on my side makes me or allows me to get through things. Um, and then the second thing was I had one night I was really struggling to, to understand this. And I I just couldn't, like, I was just like, I just can't do this. I can't keep going. And so I decided to listen to to some, um, testimonies from the prophets. Uh, there's a, there's a YouTube clip that goes through the testimony of, of Christ. Mm -hmm. And I was just listening to it and the spirit, um, was kind of hitting me and I was just like, yeah, this is great and all, but it was mostly talking about sins and being forgiven for sins. And I said, yeah, Christ did that. And he, he's able to forgive us for sins. I get that, but he doesn't know what it's like to be paralyzed. He doesn't know what it's like. Yeah. He, he walked, you know, holding a cross, but he was able to walk. And so the spirit kind of 
smacked me <laughs> a little side uh, sm- side smack up the side of the head and and said look he can forgive your sins you think he doesn't understand what it's like to be paralyzed mm. and it was just like this whole okay you know what he does he knows what it's like i don't know how i does it's a concept that i can't fully understand but I know that he knows what it's like to be paralyzed or to have anxiety or to, to have, to have a family member that's autistic Mm -hmm. or he, you know, any, any struggle, he really went through it all. And understanding that has helped me, um, have more strength for him because I can rely on him. I can say, you know what? He does know. And he can he can bear this cross with me. Mm-hmm. I'm not alone. I don't have to do it all my, by myself. And um, it's really kind of changed my relationship with him, and and helped me understand the atonement on a much deeper level. That's that's amazing. What a sometimes it's sad that we have to go through such deep and dark and hard things <laughs> to to finally understand how much God really does love us right. and how much he understands us and how much he wants to help us. But that's when I really figured it out too, was right. in my hard time as well. Um, and so it's a blessing to learn that he's strong enough for both of us, right? right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that, that he can help us and give us strength that, that two people with God can do anything. Right. right? Um, yeah, that's powerful. Do you have a favorite Bible verse that has become meaningful to you through all of this? I do. And ironically, it's something that has been with me since my junior year of high school. And so actually back then is when it resonated with me. And um, it's it's Isaiah 41.10. And it says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Ooh, I love that. And yeah, I, I like as a junior in college, I was like, oh, we're cool, we're studying, the, or in high school, we're studying the Old Testament, and then mm-hmm. this came up, and I was just like, man, this resonated with me forever. And ironically enough, um, after I was in the hospital, my now wife, we were just good friends at the time, she came in and she she was really supportive and, and helpful to, you know, bring in like quotes or nice pick me ups. Mm-hmm. And this is one that came in. She's like, I want to share you, share with you my favorite scripture. And it was this one. I'm like, no, this is my favorite scripture <laughs> actually. And it was just kind of like a, another, um, testimony to me that God said, you know, fear thou not, I'm with thee and I am, I am your strength. Like that's what is there. And it is kind of another, thing I can lean on in times that that are hard that I can look back and be like, you know what? He's, he's still there. Whether I, whether or not I feel him, you know, whether, whatever struggle it is, whether it's with paralysis or something else, I know that he's, he understands it. He's there and he can help me get to the, to the next step or wherever I need to keep going. That is awesome. So what tips would you share perhaps with somebody else that has recently become paralyzed? What would you tell them? I would say, uh, first and foremost, you need to um, have hope. Life isn't worth the living if you don't have hope. And hang on to whatever hope you have at all to either walk again or to you know gain, regain independence and having a good life because it's there it's, and it's totally possible. Um, I I feel like a lot of times you hear, you know, people that do walk again, like, Oh, the doctors told me I would never walk, but I knew I would. And and so I had that hope and I still do. But, um, with that, I know other people that they hang on to that hope and they, they kind of get stuck in the hope of I'm going to walk and that's all I'm focused on. Mm. So to me, it became a, a kind of balancing act between, holding on to the hope and addressing what I could do at the time. And, you know, it kind of, I got to the point where things just weren't progressing and I didn't want to keep fighting because it was so frustrating. Keep fighting to walk, keep fighting to walk to gain, you know, a little bit more. Um, when I had a whole other world of opportunity waiting for me mm. that 
I, I could be focused on walking and maybe, yeah, maybe more things would have happened. I don't know. But I, I still hold on to that. I still work on that a little bit, but I had, you know, graduating and, and finishing college and getting a job and marrying my wife and focusing on all these different areas of my life that weren't, that weren't walking, but they were still huge stepping stones to, to regaining independence and living a fully happy and, and functional life. Mm. And so, um, those, those two things are really pivotal of uh, having the hope and hanging on to it, but also addressing what you can do and, and embracing your new life. Um, and then another one is, is just that God really is aware of us, that we're not alone and he understands us that if we l- rely on him, we can really, uh, overcome in, in much greater ways than we ever thought possible. And that maybe, you know what, um, I had, this is just total off, off hand, but I had a lot of blessings that said I would be healed mm. and that I would regain you know, the functionality and it hasn't happened so far, but maybe it's not what God had in store for me and that me being healed has led me into other paths and it's not, I'm not healed walking, but I'm healed in a lot of other ways. And so, um, God's aware of us and he knows what we need and what we can give to others. And so kind of embrace it and and just enjoy the journey. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. I love that you had goals in many areas instead of only walking, you right. know? And so I think that's what's given your life such fullness, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> it's, it, it's so frustrating when you are trying to do something, like trying to move my leg and it just doesn't move no matter how hard <laughs> I think. Like I'm just trying to do this and it doesn't. And just that level of frustration that it's like, you know what? It's just I me. Mean, it's not. It's not there right now. Yeah. But someday, yeah. Absolutely. Someday, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If not in this life, definitely when exactly. you get that resurrected body, that's perfect, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm gonna get some good stretching in. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell me what resources or books that you would perhaps recommend. So I, I mean, there's so many resources out there for um, paralysis. If you just you can kind of look up um, one of somebody that I have admired and read a couple books, uh, well, at least one books, and I've heard him speak um, a couple times. Is a guy named Chad Hymas, mm-hmm. and so definitely go um, kind of look him up. But there, there's a lot of motivational speakers or um, people that are out there that are wheelchair users or have recovered from paralysis that have given my life um, perspective mm-hmm. and and hope, uh, but. The, the number one thing I think that's helped me and at least in the recent, you know, year or two is this book, Extreme Ownership. So I definitely recommend reading that. Awesome. Um, it's, it's, it's a little bit, it's, you know, it's, it's ex Navy SEALs talking uh-huh. about their experiences. So, um, you know, if military stuff's not your thing, then take that <laughs> maybe <look>. not, <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe not check it out. But, um, that, that was really a huge freeing blessing in my life to read that book and understand how much control I had, even with only being able to really control about 30% of my body. So, right. No, that's awesome. And Matt, if people have really resonated with, um, what you've shared here today, how do they get in contact with you or find you on social media? Yeah, absolutely. Um, check me out on Facebook miracles for Matt. Um, I, a really good looking guy. Yes, you <laughs> as are. the profile. <laughs> uh, no, I'm kidding. Just, just me in a, in a suit, but, uh, uh, maybe I should probably change that image at some, some point of a wheelchair <laughs> to make more, a little more sense. But anyway, yeah. Miracles for Matt on Facebook. Um, and definitely check us out on YouTube. My, my wife and I have a little vlog that we do that kind of talking about what paralysis is and, and how you can still live a good life and, and accomplish and, do so much. And so uh, check us out on YouTube. It's Matt and Sloan, S L O A N. Um, yeah, come check us out and, and awesome. feel free to message me from either one of those. That is fantastic. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of your amazing story and the lessons learned diving deep to your pain points and how you came out the other side victorious. This has just been an amazing journey. Absolutely. And I, I, I will reiterate that 
you know, it's, it's, I think sometimes we feel like it's, you cross that bridge and then you're done, but it's, it's still an uphill battle. And I don't <laughs> think I'll ever be totally done with the struggles, but, um, you know, it's, it's life and, and it's a roller coaster and the, the ups are only as good as the downs. <laughs> I love that. We'll have to make a meme out of it. The ups are only as good as the t shirt or something. (laughs) There you go. Love it. Thank you, Matt. This has been awesome. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much for listening to today's show. I know that there are many of you out there that are going through a hard time, and I hope you found things that have been useful today as you listen to the podcast. If you would like to access the show notes from today's podcast, visit my website. It is storiesofhopepodcast.com. That is where you'll find favorite quotes from today's episode and shareable memes. And those are fun because you can share them with your friends on social media. You will also find the links mentioned throughout today's episode so you don't have to remember what those were. And also all the tips that were shared. Sometimes tips are shared so much throughout an episode you forget. What were those great things? So go to the show notes, storiesofhopepodcast.com to look up these fantastic resources. You know, if someone kept coming to mind during today's episode, perhaps that means that you should share this with them. Maybe there was a story shared or a tip that they really, really need to hear. So go ahead and share this episode with them. May God bless you, especially if you are struggling with hope to carry on and with the strength to keep going when things get tough. Remember to walk with Christ and he will help bear that burden. Above all else, remember God loves you.